everyone. Uh, welcome back to In Real Lore. Today, Nick and I are going through five well-known Imperial Guard weapons, and I am going to talk to you about the medical implications of them. Yeah, we're going to go over what these weapons are in re lore, and we're going to go over the damage that they can do, the conflict on the normal human being. Yeah. We're, we're not going to talk about the Xeno side, because... I don't even know what the Xeno side is. I don't know <laughs> what the kind of carapace of a Tyranid and damage and blah, 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 blah. Whatever. We have human standards. We're humans. It's the best way that yeah. we can kind of acknowledge things, right? So we're going to go over that way. Well, it's my first look at all these weapons, and basically... They all shoot to kill. <laughs> yeah, everything shoots to kill, right? So everything is going to go along that line. Um, it's just a matter of how much damage they can do to you before you are dead. <laughs> right? All right? Take me through them. Yeah, absolutely. So the first one that we are going to go over is probably the most ubiquitous and most well-known weapon in all of 40k, and as well as the most well used in the Imperial Guard, which is the Lasgun. The humble Lasgun. The humble last gun. The humble last gun. It yes. is easy to repair. It is easy to manufacture. Um, it is charged by a battery pack that can be charged in the sunlight and can be used as a grenade. It can be thrown in mud and rebuilt and remade without any issues. And it is lovingly called a flashlight. What? Yes, because it is considered one of the weakest weapons in all of 40k. All right, tell me what it does. Yeah, so it is a focused pinpoint laser beam, which is strong enough to blast holes into concrete, um, blast the arm off of a normal human being. And that's your weakest weapon? That is the weakest weapon. Oh, poor guys. <laughs> All right. Um, it's, does it do anything else? Uh, it doesn't do too much else because it is just, it's a laser gun. It's so, the most focused one, right? Yeah. You gave me homework. I did my homework. You did do your homework. And it does. You can get a bayonet attached to it. You can it does, get a bayonet. It, it's close range combat, so important. Absolutely. And I'll tell you why now. Okay. Um, so I looked at this. I, I Googled this on, what is it? Fandom 40K? Uh, it is <laughs> yeah. the wiki of yeah, yeah. 40K. You know, the normal go. thing. Okay. So a few things. Uh, so number one, this is the weakest gun in Warhammer. It is considered the all weakest right, gun. Right. Okay. So first thing you got to think about is the fact that it can like, it's got a laser and it can cut like, okay. So one thing I found really interesting is that it can amputate, but it self cauterizes the wound. So what happens is you can't just die from like, you know, unfortunately like brutal blood loss. Not only do you lose your arm, you lose your arm, but then you have like a beautiful cauterization to it. So you just are <laughs> suffering while you're in battle. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing we're going to think about, which I'll get to is you're effectively burned there. So probably die of septic shock eventually. Yeah. Um, so number one, you lose limbs. Number two, it does sound like you are going to be suffering from kind of significant burn. So even though they're pinpoint, I think mm -hmm. I read something that it will go through weak armor as well. But we're thinking about it into the context of humans, right? Like the Imperial Guard. <laughs> yeah, because we want to yeah. know what kind of damage it could do to the human body. Yeah, so I if you're thinking about these yeah. like small little pinpoint... Um, sorry, give me one second. Um, so... Aside from cauterizing and amputating limbs, then we're mm -hmm. thinking about burns because a lot of the times, you know, if that laser is going through the middle of your body, it is going to leave a hole. And depending on where it goes through, whether or not it's your heart, your lungs, your kidney, whatever, is going to dictate the level of damage. So even though these are pinpoint, mm -hmm. um, they can still significantly impact kind of like an average, I guess, Imperial Guard, right? Which is your, which is your average Joe. Yeah. We're using that as our kind of standard, you know, yeah. they're... You're, you're pretty typical. So these are humans, Human, right? The yeah. guard, just so I know. They're just humans okay, cool. with like pretty good body armor for our day. All right. So you got amputation. We got some third and fourth degree burns. Yeah. The other one I thought was really interesting is the way it amputates. It actually vaporizes the limb. So not only does the limb kind of fall <laughs> off. No, it does. It vaporizes it. So like it is beyond a fourth degree burn. And I'll go through that with one of our next uh, weapons. But essentially yeah. it's beyond a fourth degree burn. It's just like poof, which is, I mean, un unheard of in modern medicine, but that is some bad stuff. Yeah. And then lastly is in relation to the bayonet, right? So this brings you back to like the, the you know, World War One, for example, putting on close range combat. That's a, a, basically- A fixed, a fixed bayonet, Essentially, charge. yeah. They're basically <laughs> knife wounds, right? So I yeah. mean, your the fatality of them is gonna depend on where they hit. They can be extremely fatal if they're gonna hit the heart. Mm -hmm. um, you can escape them if they're gonna hit your kidney. Basically, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, that's something that we have in our normal day right now. So it's kind of funny that it's still yeah. a thing in the- in 40k in the future i say sir nick do you have any questions for me no i'm pretty like that's pretty well explained like it's okay. a, it is a laser so like mm -hmm. a normal laser is just going to burn you it's a high energy like 
particles that are hitting you and just well, doing so what they here's can. the thing of all the like of the five weapons you gave me, they all have high energy particles. So they like I mean, burns are going to be a you're going to see this pattern throughout the the next five of them, but it's how they do it and what else they have and the type of fuel they did. I actually did my homework and I looked at some of the fuel. Okay. And some of the fuel, especially in one of them, we'll get to it. Yeah. Um, you'll be really interested to see how it works. Yes, because I think I know this one because I was going to point it out when I was going to do my part of talking ah, about it. okay, which is good. All yeah, because right, so. I, I, am I thinking about the fourth one? I don't know. We'll, we'll just go for it. Oh, come on. All right. No, 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 no just you keep going. All right, what's next? All right, the next one we're going to talk about is the plasma gun. Okay. So this is a, uh, it's, fuel fed into a miniature fusion core uh, core inside the weapon hydrogen energizes into the plasma state of the weapon which is held into the core by a powerful magnet containment uh this is a pretty typical of anti-armor uh the only thing with this weapon is is that it does kind of tend to backfire that's dumb so in the tabletop what happens is you are rolling a d6 in order to hit things and with the imperial plasma gun in particular if you roll a one the Model that has the plasma gun is dead. That, I'm telling you, it's a dumb weapon. Even space marines that have plasma guns, they are two wounds compared to the Imperial Guard's typical one. So if you're playing Imperial Guard, just just put it on the Imperial Guard. He has one wound. He's he's disposable. Like the Imperial Guard, they all are disposable. Let's just get another one to show, show what up. What do you mean? They only have one hit point? Yeah, so... I just played my first game, like Game of Kill Team today, so I just realized how important hit points are. So it's a little bit different to the big game yeah, of yeah. 40k because 40k is like, you know, larger scale, whereas like Spec Ops, you're obviously trying to make sure that like, you know, one model can last a little bit longer mm -hmm. than like, oh, I shot you with like my little pew pew gun and you're dead. Like, yeah, mm, no. Whereas the guard and like with the bigger tabletop games, you're like. I am throwing in a volley of artillery at you. I'm expecting the entire battalion to die. Okay, fair enough. So, yeah. I mean, in terms of how this, so, I mean, remember, I'm going to tell you here, you're going to see one, like, very overarching pattern here, which is burns. Burns, yeah. burns, and burns. But this one here, it's got a few different types of damages I can inflict, right? Mainly, okay. if we're going to put, like, we'll, we'll talk about the backfire, which is just dumb. So, I, I wouldn't use this weapon if I were you. Um, but it, it can inflict two types of damages, Burns and radiation exposure. So the thing is, I looked at how this is created, and this is a fusion reactor. So this is like the sun. So it essentially, because it has hydrogen atoms in it, yeah. you're getting radiation exposure. So think <laughs> Chernobyl. That's what's happening when you yeah. get this thing hitting you, right? So number one, we're going to talk about burns. And I want to get into burns, I think, in a little bit more detail in our, our next one. So I'm going to table that for now. Okay. Um, number two, let's talk about radiation sickness, right? So if you guys have watched HBO show Chernobyl, looked at a lot of that stuff. Yeah. I looked at Hiroshima. Um, oh, a lot it's, of people it's know awful, really. it's it's terrible, but a lot of the radiation exposure effects don't happen until a few days later. Mm -hmm. So it's dose dependent. I'll stick up a, a and Nick will uh, put up a, a table here in and post, but essentially it's dose dependent and it depends on how much of a dose. I can't tell you how much of a dose we're getting in this, but I'm assuming it's well, just so much large because it's Warhammer and it's, you know, it's going to do dumb stuff. Yeah. So then acute radiation syndrome has a few different things. Um, essentially what it is, is that, you know, radiation is really bad on kind of the stem cells of your body. So if we go mm -hmm. back to like biology, the stem cells are the cells that divide into everything that make, you know, brain cells, blood cells, bone marrow cells, and so forth. So the thing is radiation kills it. So if you think yeah. about, yeah. So, I mean, if you think about the kids who've had leukemia and so forth, you actually radiate their bone marrow, right? So that you can kill all the bad cells yeah. and give them a transplant. That's essentially what this is, but on a greater scale. Yeah. It's, you see it in a lot of stories and everything. When mm -hmm. someone has radiation sickness, they start getting yeah. like, one, they like maybe their lungs are breaking down, so they start spitting up blood, or yeah. the, like the lining of their stomach starts going, <gasps> or even ones yes. that have been treated with that kind of yeah, like, yeah. like just treating that part, they still have a whole lot of cancers that just start showing up. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, what you're doing is you're, you know, I mean, a lot of the stem cells are just getting are, number one, you kill them, but then a lot of them are probably differentiating improperly. Um, so the other thing is though. With a lot of radiation exposure, you mm -hmm. use it to treat cancers, right? But back to kind of the weapon itself. So yeah. acute radiation exposure has kind of three different facets, okay? Uh, number one, you kill the bone marrow. And we talked about that in the context of like, you know, leukemia patients who need stem cell transplants. But you're killing the bone marrow anyway. So in mm -hmm. a uh, in a, in a a warrior who has, 
like, you know. So in a warrior whose bone marrow has essentially died, yeah. uh, think about them hemorrhaging and think about them getting infections. Number one, you don't have red blood cells and platelets, which are important in creating yeah. blood and, and clotting. clotting. Yeah, platelets are clotters, right? See, I listen enough. I know I clotting. Know, there you I know go. the word clotting. But number two, words. white blood cells are really important at the, you know, fighting off infection, right? So mm-hmm. you're, you're pretty much there. Okay. Then we have the GI syndrome. So this is what you alluded to. Yeah. And this includes infection, dehydration, and an electrolyte imbalance. Essentially, the GI system, which is your your guts and the way that you take in nutrients, is going to start breaking down. Yeah. You have a lot of stem cells that are actually in your GI system, and people don't really realize it. So you replenish your GI system on like I don't know how fast. I I, I, I cannot remember oh, my med school biology, but the it, only it happens one that quick. I remember when yeah. it comes to you have a lot of mesenchymal stem. Yeah, yeah. You have a lot of stem cells down there. The only ones that I remember with like how long your cells last in your body is your eyes. I think mm-hmm. your eyes are the lo- longest lasting cells in your entire I think body. They're the shortest, dear. Are they the shortest? I think the cornea. I think about getting a corneal abrasion, right? Like if you yeah. scratch on your eye, it's gone in two days. <laughs> I don't know, why did I think that? We'll look it up later. But we'll look it up later. Do essentially, just, what happens is your one of those things. But yeah. So essentially, what happens is your GI tract breaks down. Yeah. It can absorb nutrients. It can absorb fluids, mm-hmm. and because of that, you're prone to infection, dehydration, and you can't get the electrolytes you need. Right? Sodium, potassium, and magnesium. If any of you have kind of worked in the medical setting, you realize if you lose too much sodium or if you lose or have too much potassium you will die yeah i mean those things can kill you oh potassium especially potassium is dangerous yeah potassium don't eat too many bananas don't eat too many bananas people no really don't please (laughs) okay like just take a whole bushel of bananas and throw them out so the last one is kind of the effects to the cardiovascular system Mm -hmm. think you know edema vasculitis meningitis basically what happens is all the cells essentially are breaking down and the cells that create the walls of of the blood of the vessels so if you're having a breakdown of all the walls and the, like of all the of all the surrounding structures of your blood vessels mm-hmm. you're going to have leakage of fluid out of that and because of that you're going to have swelling in the body your heart's not going to work properly and uh, in terms of the, kind of the meningitis i'm thinking that this is just because you can't get enough fluid kind of washing up from the brain so you're probably going to be prone to infection it's a harder one but i mean for the most part the way it goes in terms of severity is you know if you have a really high dose of radiation mm-hmm. poisoning you will get the cardiovascular effects first and you will die within a few days, okay. three to four days. If you have the GI aspect of things, it's more a moderate uh, dose, yeah. you can die in a few weeks. And if you have like the bone marrow destruction, that one's a little bit more variable, but um, you know the death may not be as imminent, but it's it's there for sure. So these are kind of the three main facets of the uh, acute radiation okay. sickness. And that's one of the things you have to be aware of, especially in the context of the plasma gun, Yeah, right? Yeah. Because it is a, essentially it's, a, it's the sun. <laughs> You're getting radiation exposure every time it's hitting you. That's what I was going to say. Like either you die die straight up because it is a solar flare hitting you yeah. or like it hits to side you and you're like oh i didn't get hit yeah, <clears throat> yeah cough, but cough. like no no no, you're gonna be like you know 10 days later you're dead yeah so <laughs> right so it goes home with you the other thing that's really dumb about this is the backfire aspect of it because you're just backfiring into like you know whether or not you get hit with debris you're also getting radiation exposure back to yourself yeah. right so i wonder if these things backfire do these people die 10 days later no, because the what's happening with the backfire is basically the magnetic containment is erupting. So whatever amount of fusion is being put into this uh, thing is now... But it's radiation. But then it's just a mini sun that's like exposed to Yeah, but that's you. to the person there. So they're going to die of radiation sickness. I'm sure they're probably going to die of all the heat. <laughs> yeah, that too. We'll get to the and burns. the explosion. I promise. I promise we'll get to the burns. We're going to get to the burns. We will get to the burns. But that is the other like big piece of damage that this uh, this weapon can cause. Yeah. So this one typically is a anti-armor one. The mm. last gun was pretty okay. anti-personnel. The next one that we are talking about is the Melta gun, which is the fan favorite of the Adeptus Sororitas. They love Meltas. Are you serious? Yeah, they Ooh. are the the Bolter, the Flamer, and the Melta. And the Melta is really, really great because what it does is it's like a Flamer that's just highly pressurized and contained, so that way it can just fire right through a tank. It's used as anti-armor. So nice. on this on the tabletop, you would have a couple girls mm-hmm. in Depta Sororitas that would walk up and have a multi-melta, which is a, just a bigger version of the damn thing, and just punch a hole in a tank. Mm-hmm. And you would use that to try and take down either heavily armored units or bigger tanks. So just so I understand, what's the difference between the plasma gun and the melta gun? Uh, the plasma gun explodes. The okay. multi-melta doesn't, or the melta does not. Like, what do you mean? Because both of them have a, uh, 
Well, this one's got a bit of a fuel mix, but it also does some fission as well, or fusion as well. Yeah, so in the tabletop aspect of it, a plasma gun is about the same strength as a melta gun, but uh, the melta gun is going to hit through harder comparatively to the plasma gun. Okay. And okay. the melta usually is a lot stronger than the plasma gun. You know what I have in my notes? What? I have a heat gun, a.k.a. flamethrower on steroids. That's what I wrote to myself. <laughs> Which, and then, no, 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 listen to this. Yeah. Then I have in caps, burns, 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 burns. Yes, because even when it's being described in, like, the codexes and everything, yeah. it <clears throat> is it just vaporizes any human that gets in the way. Because you yeah. don't really use it, want to waste it on a human because... So wait, like, if it hits a human, human's gone? Yes, because... So there's nothing to talk about. Human's dead. <laughs> like, there's nothing to... Like, they're vapor... Yeah. What am I supposed to say to this? <laughs> oh, or, okay, I do. I do have. I do have some information on it. Yeah. Well, let me explain. Like okay. a melta gun is usually going to do uh, a d6 of damage, and if you're closer, it's going to do d6 plus two. A plasma gun usually does four. The las gun does one. Okay. But a las gun one shot will kill a human, and obviously, if you shoot a human with a melta gun, like oh, I just did eight damage to you. I killed eight people. Yeah, but I just feel Instead like they killing vaporized. eight people, I killed you. Yeah, but like I feel like the human is vaporized. Yeah, but yeah. So then, what can I say medically? <laughs> They're gone. They're in air. <laughs> All right. Okay. I do have two things though to talk about. So number okay. one, this okay. is okay. a okay. fusion based like. Can I talk? Yeah. yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Sweet. I'm good. So number one, it's a fusion based like device you still have the radiation exposure stuff so even if you're getting like you know if it's armor piercing if you're in there for example and not hit for ex- like you still you're still subjected to all the radiation exposure okay mm-hmm. uh, at least this was my understanding yeah. i don't see hydrogen atoms here but it does talk about still being a a fusion like reactor hmm. in this gun so i mean let me know down below if i i am incorrect in that but if not you know we're digging radiation especially if there's fusion like um like reaction happening the other thing is going to be the burn. So this one is going to have um, focused burn. So this was the interesting thing about this. This one is a little mm-hmm. bit more focused in its its range. So even though it's stronger, it's still like focused. Um, I think it's a focused whatever it puts out. Focused plasma, focused something, right? Yeah, it's a focused shot instead of being That's spread out to multiple to things. It's kind of... It's like the last gun where it will shoot accurately into one yes. thing, whereas the Melta will do the same thing, oh. but with a different... Yes. When these, when the melted gun hits, it hits kind of in a focused beam range, right? And, you know, when we're talking about the type of damage, aside from radiation exposure, it's burns. That's a big one. So you have first degree, second degree, third degree, and fourth degree burns. Basically, I'll put a diagram up here, but, you know, third and fourth are bad. As you go down for second, third, fourth, the severity of the burn and the depth of the burn is more. So we're thinking, you know, with a focused, with the focused hit, you're getting third and fourth degree burns. So third degree burns are pretty much like all the way down to all layers of the skin, but hasn't hit muscle and hasn't hit bone yet. Fourth degree burns are really bad. They're all the way down and they're through muscle, through bone, and they're pretty much catastrophic in terms of the way that they, um, in terms of the effect to a human. So what are the effects of burns? And, and I wanted to allude to that because people don't realize how, you know, a burn is a burn and a first degree sunburn, you get better, put some aloe on it. But when you have really bad burns, the effects on the body are astronomical. Like they're huge. Um, do you know what the effects of burns are on the body? Pain, pain. Um, and pain, and pain. Skin just kind of peeling away. Um, just a lot of gross stuff that I've seen on your computer okay, screen. Okay. Not gross stuff. Okay, here. Okay, it's gr- it, okay, there's a few things, okay? So, number one, you can't regulate heat because the skin is a huge regulator of heat, right? So, if you're burned on big areas of the skin or if you have very severe um, burns to different areas of the skin, you can't regulate heat. So, you get cold and you can actually die of hypothermia. Mm-hmm. So, that's out in the field, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, number two, you can also lose large amounts of water. So, the thing is we sweat a ton and in, a, in burned skin, you lose the ability to sweat. So, that's the other one right so if you have you know a huge body surface area of a burn that's going to be the big one yeah um you also are at a very high risk of infection from wounds so remember when you're burned that becomes a cesspool of bacteria and you can actually get infected so usually in your third and fourth degree burns you're covering them with dressings and you're covering them with bacterial dressings Mm -hmm. because there's such a high risk of infection. Almost all these guys are on systemic antibiotics of some sort. So bloodborne antibiotics, whether it's by mouth or 
through intravenous in a human at least <laughs> all right um there's a few other things too mm -hmm. um so you do have because what happens is when you get a burn the blood vessels start becoming leaky so when they become leaky you get a lot of swelling in different parts of the body so that think we call it edema but just think puffy like michelin man type swelling yeah yeah <laughs> that's gonna yeah no it's like and it's bad because what happens is when you get swelling out of the body that means all the fluid is coming out of the blood vessels. So your fluid is either in the blood vessel or it's in the tissues. And if you get swelling in the body, that means the blood vessel is leaking the fluid into the tissues. Okay. And then you have no blood to go to your heart or to your brain or to your lungs. And that's a problem because you need the blood in the blood vessels to get around your body. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of my most rudimentary way of explaining it. Yeah. So not only does it hurt to get burnt, but it also causes all of these catastrophic effects as well. Right? Yeah, because yeah. like that's the one thing I think I remember from all your like little things was like you keep like the wound wet. You try and make yeah. sure that like it's yeah. covered and like make sure the burn is like really, really nice. Listen and... to that, eh? <sighs> it's <laughs> it's burned into my brain. Yeah. And I also remember that host episode with the guy with a lot of burns, and they brought mm. the, the the maggots, leeches. No, they brought maggots in. That's weird. That was a weird one. No, don't want to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. No, don't want to talk about it. But um, essentially when it comes to kind of the burns themselves, so you do have a few types. Um, we talked about third and fourth degree. Usually as you get to third and fourth degree burns, yeah. um, you actually stop feeling pain. And the reason why is they're so deep that you've killed the pain receptors in the body. Oh. I mean, will you be in pain because of everything else going on? <laughs> Hell yeah. But, you know, you may not actually feel pain at the site of the burn, like at the back of your hand. But yeah. I mean, all that other stuff we talked about is going on and they're likely going to die of septic shock or they're going to die of like fluid loss or they're going to die of like actual shock in the field. Yeah. So it seems like in the guard so far, it's just, just I mean, even fighting other guard. Which... Can I just confirm, are these the weakest weapons I'm talking about? Um, the, the melting gun is pretty damn strong, All right, okay, okay. but these are the most, like, I'm, I'm saying these are like the most common and the most yeah. like used in the Imperial guard and by the sisters. But yeah, I'm going to just say in the Imperial guard, it's better just to die. Yeah. It's better. And this you is, you don't want to survive any of these. And this is if you're just fighting another guard. Yeah. You're not fighting, you know, anything else. We'll talk about other weapons at some point, but like. You're just fighting other guard, and this is what's happening so to you. So why does anyone want to play the guard? It sounds like they're pretty weak. Because it's just the everyman. It is the struggle of the underdog that is going up and... But how do they fight? Like how By just waves and waves okay. and waves of men and just overwhelming artillery and just tanks and everything else. Yeah, I don't understand that, but It's okay. just pure numbers. It's All a right. pure numbers game. Even in the... On the tabletop, there's a joke where... Or like a joke list where someone can bring like 300 conscripts wow and they win just because they just it's like okay you killed a hundred okay another hundred come they just keep coming <laughs> they just don't stop coming and they don't stop coming and they don't stop coming and they don't stop i don't know coming. the reference all all stars back no. to the world and get the hair i'm running anyway what's next the next up is the flamer so this is still kind of in the same vibe as like a World War War One weapon, which you would go up with a gas tank on the back and just flush out trenches with a spewing spout of flames. The only difference with the Flamer in 40K is that it actually uses a particular type of fuel code, yes, Promethium. This, this is what I was going to say. Yes. So this actually has some attributes similar to Greek fire in history, in which it would actually not be drenched or Denched, dwenched, what's the term? Drenched? Like, quelling quenched, the- Quenched, quenched, yeah. quenched, thank you. Quenched with water. And it was a sticky, like, gel substance mm -hmm. that would stick to, like, whatever it did. And if you jumped in water, well, it's just burning in the water and you're not going to get any relief. So that's what actually fuels these flamers and the Prometheum just sticks to everything and lights everything aflame and burns it's used for anti-infantry. You're not going to do much against a tank with a flamer, mm -hmm. but you will do quite a bit of significant damage to a squad of mm -hmm. infantrymen. So this is what I thought about this when I was researching it, okay? Okay. I said these are like the melted gun, but they're more diffuse. 
Yeah. Yeah. So that's what, like the you know I feel like I'm pretty okay with that. Yeah. So I think that the like okay so the Promethean fuel is really interesting. Um, and I only got to it at the end when I was just taking a look at some stuff mm-hmm. and I I clicked on the link and I'm like oh crap so this stuff doesn't come off you so it's like because it sounds like you know in addition to kind of that thermal burn mm-hmm. like I don't know if there's an element of a chemical burn that's happening with this fuel when it's sticking on I don't think so but yeah, I'm just trying I to get an idea. Yeah. yeah. I don't remember anything being said. So we're just gonna go with the thermal burn essentially, yeah. right? So yeah. the way I thought about these ones is okay i mean i'm thinking a giant flamethrower right just going (laughs) but i'm thinking about a lot of first and second degree burns because you're aiming it at infantry and yeah it's probably not going to be strong enough to go through a tank right yeah so our first and second degree burns are stuff that you know you guys are very apt to knowing i mean i don't burn very much but as you can look at nick he burns a little bit more than me Um, but essentially our first degree burn i know right (laughs) it does hurt (laughs) So you get your dry red skin. It feels pa- very painful. And mainly because it's so superficial to the like, top of the skin that all your pain receptors are still there. So they're firing. They're saying, hey, hey, treat me. Um, so think about a really nice red roasty sunburn, right? So if you're just getting hit with it slightly, you could have this. But if you're anywhere within the actual flame range itself, you're likely going to be suffering from a second or a third degree burn. So we've already talked about third, but second degree burns are just a little bit deeper than first degree burns. Mm -hmm. You got a lot of blisters. You got a lot of weeping. It's still quite red. And these are actually one of the most painful burns because they're just deep enough. Uh... They're still hitting all the pain receptors. So you're getting that increased level of pain. Once you go to third degree burns, you're losing the pain because you're going a little bit deeper. Yeah. So these ones can take a few weeks to heal, about two to three weeks. And sometimes they actually need skin grafts to heal. Whereas first degree burns just need a little bit of TLC, a bit of cold prom presses and some, aloe vera. Some aloe. Just, yeah. put some, just put some aloe on it. You know. No, the- I mean, that stuff is great. Oh, yeah. That's why I'm, we have a plant in the house. Yeah, it's great. It's great. And then the third degree burns that are really bad, right? Think severe blisters. They're white. Um, they're not painful anymore because the nerves are damaged. And these ones need skin grafts to heal. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. those are like the main things that you're seeing there. The other thing, though, that you want to be aware of as well is the respiratory side of things, right? So if you're thinking of these flamethrowers, think about like oh. just the smoke, right? Oh. So, you I mean, you're getting like these irritants in your in your lungs. You're getting the smoke in your lungs. Whether or not, you know, I don't really think it's bringing in a lot of carbon monoxide, for example, because you're outside when you're hitting 40K and you're killing each other, right? Yeah. Um, but, I mean, if you're getting enough smoke in your lungs, you could admit yourself to respiratory particles, even respiratory failure, right? So, just difficulty breathing, lots of coughing, not being able to run anymore, right? Just think about being in a really bad, like... We all, you know, we we know about the wildfires, right? If any yeah. of you have lived kind of in the areas of the wildfire, you could just feel that that, you know, your ability to breathe was a lot less, right? So imagine that on a, on a higher level. This okay. flamethrower is around you. You're being charred. People are being charred. And you're just you're breathing it in. Cool. So, you know, <laughs> one or two of your, like... You know, one walks up on your squad, takes out half your squad. You're trying to run away and your ability to run away is decreasing as it goes along. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, right, because if it's in your lungs, you're not able to exchange the oxygen while you're getting soot in your lungs, essentially. Yeah. Just think about running in really bad smog. Oh, yeah. Right. It's pretty similar. Yeah. So that's the other thing that, you know, you don't think about from the onset, but that's a huge thing to think about in addition to the burns. But see, the thing is, in the guard, if you're trying to run away, the commissar is going to be there to make sure you don't run away. Yeah. See my other video for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, yeah, that's the, f- the flamer. Gotta love the flamer. That's the other one the sisters love. Remember? They love, they love flamers. Oh, I have flamers? Yes. Sweet. Sisters love, yeah, yeah, yeah. they love flamers. Okay. The holy trinity, the yep. bolter, the flamer, and the melta. Nice. They love them. Uh, the last up that we have is probably the simplest, but it's just solely because of the users of this weapon. So this is actually the Ogryn Ripper Gun. This is pretty much just a uh, semi-automatic shotgun, but just pumped up to the size of an Ogryn. And so now, just that way you know, an Ogryn is an abhuman. They are a mutated strain of humanity that is accepted. Mostly just because they are usually about nine feet tall. They have traded all of their intelligence, though, for pure beef. They are dumb. The smartest ogre can count to four. Huh. And that's because they use their fingers. The ogre, they're wonderful, though, because they'll follow orders. They'll do everything. But the thing is, is that with their ripper guns, they actually have to put in built-in inhibitors in them. Put them on burst mode because the ogrens don't know what to do. They they slap the magazine so on and they start. That's what that meant. Yes, I so, couldn't figure it out. So they have to make sure that the ogrens aren't 
shooting all of their like yeah. like ammunition in one go. So they have to put like, a stop. They have to put a stop it. To <laughs> bu- 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 and the goblin goes, I, I won't shoot. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Just to make sure that they're not using it because ogrins are just dumb. And mm-hmm. if you're playing Dark Tide right now, ogrins are so dumb that even the one in Dark Tide who has an a enhancement chip to make him a little smarter, just a little bit. Count to six. He can count to six. <laughs> um, he actually, when he throws his grenades, they said throw a grenade at the enemy. He throws a box of grenades. Yeah, fair enough. Started being I mean, primed. He listens. He he listens very well. He's just you know who reminds don't, me of he's don't dumb. The John Baptista character. Drax? Um, yeah, Drax! <laughs> That's yeah, who this is. Very similar, just big. They beef. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I beef. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's pretty much... It's also to their size. So an Ogren's nine foot tall. How big is it? Like, yay? Uh, that's about the size of a regular... Yay. Shock. It's probably going to be like, yay. yay. You can't even see it on the... It's probably like double aughts, like slugs. So okay. like that big. Yeah. If anyone's played Bioshock, the original Bioshock, you had double odd shotgun. Oh, it's glorious. Uh, anyway. But yeah, Hold that is the shotgun. <laughs> All right. So I, I mean, this one is not as interesting as the rest. No, it's because not. it's just, it, it's, it's, it's an automatic shotgun. <laughs> like, <laughs> we all know what it's going to do. You're going to get bullet wounds and shotguns. Like, you know, the shotgun, like wounds tend to be a little bit worse just because it goes into multiple particles, right? Yeah. So I mean, think blunt force trauma. Not blunt force, sorry. Um, just think about kind of gunshot wounds. Those are the big ones, right? So depending on where they shoot, whether or not they get an arm, it's not going to be as fatal. Yeah. Um, but if they get a torso wound, that's going to be quite fatal, right? Depending on where you're, where you're, uh, where you're damaging, right? Heart, lung, liver, kidney. Those are pretty. It, it, those are pretty important areas of the body. Um, if they do hit one of the one of the limbs, I mean. You can drag them out of battle or you can sacrifice them. I don't care how you do these things in 40K. Yeah. But usually they're not as, um, it's not as life threatening, at least at that point in time. Yeah. Will you be killed eventually? Probably. But I mean, these are kind of the least, uh, I, th- I find that these are, out of, the, out of the five that you gave me, I find that this is kind of the least dangerous and the most boring. Now, the question that I'm actually leaving up for this. So this is like probably double the size of a regular shotgun mm-hmm. in the hands of an ogre. Yep. How much damage could it do if the ogre started hitting you with it because you forgot how to shoot it? Probably more than if it shot you. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, probably bash your head in. Yeah. Yeah. He's just he's like, I can't shoot, sir. (laughs) Well, I mean, no. I'm seriously, you just take it in your butt, right? I mean, I I think we're playing kill team, and you could butt the end of the gun. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it'll do some serious damage. Think about the head injury you could get. Oh. Um. The strong men that usually you see, the ones that are like okay. seven foot tall. Think about a little bit taller than that and beefier. Well, think about, think right? about them hitting you with Force a gun. Force equals mass times acceleration. Yeah. So if your mass is that big and they're able to accelerate a little bit faster and the mass of this is also pretty high, you're going to get some pretty bad, like you could get your head caved in. Probably yeah, pretty, pretty easily. Serious. Yeah, I mean, in which case that is a pretty fatal blow. That's why you got to be very, very happy when the ogre and arm yeah. is your side and not the other side. I mean, so then we're talking about head trauma, right? Or we're talking about blunt force trauma. So blunt force trauma is its own thing as well, Ooh, right? Okay. So if you think about, you know, with all of these, and I didn't really think of it in that context, but if you just take the end of the butt and you start hitting people, <laughs> you're getting blunt force trauma. Yeah. So that, you know, the deadliness of that also depends on kind of the force that's being um it's being used, yep. but also where you're getting hit, right? So let's just start from head to toe. So yeah. your head hit you with this thing, you're going to have catastrophic brain damage. And, and big man. Big yeah. Man. In most cases, you're probably going to have catastrophic brain damage. If you're wearing a helmet, you may abate that, but you're going to have bad TBIs, which are traumatic brain injuries, bad concussions, right? Yeah. Um, which are kind of in its own self. Yeah. Then if you go down into the heart, you know, you can actually have pretty bad blunt force trauma into the heart. There's actually a syndrome. I can't remember it off the top of my head right now. Uh, let me know down below if you guys have it. I, I will find it. But you can get hit at the exact moment when your heart is beating and it actually causes a cardiac arrest. Yeah, I yeah. think there's been... It, like, there's a few of them. With it boxing, in sports. Yeah, 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 yeah. Boxing and MMA. Yeah. So it's a big one, right? So, I mean, if you're hitting the... Tr- and the other thing is you can cause like a collapsed lung, right? So if you think yeah. about it, you know, if you're hitting hard enough, you can collapse one of your lungs. Um, in which case that's going to be an issue when you're breathing the other yeah. thing is you can break ribs that was what I was about to yeah. ask you like especially if this is you know 10 tons of beef you know, rib. Yeah. yeah 100% the rib can puncture the lung and it can create two types of collapsed lungs right yeah and a collapsed lung is called a, a pneumothorax like okay. in case so you can have a regular pneumothorax which is you know multiple holes in the lung and you just it's collapsed like think about a ball or think about a balloon <laughs> done right <laughs> then you can have something called a tension pneumothorax where it's a one-way valve yeah. So the rib punctures the uh, lung, air goes in, 
but air can't come out. Ah. Right. So it's like blowing up, blowing up, blowing up, blowing up, blowing up until like it just basically takes up all the space and yeah. squeezes your heart and you die. Fun. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Then we can go down here, right? So then you have your abdomen area there. You can cause a lot of blood force trauma and a lot of bleeding in there, right? So liver, kidney, spleen. Um, it's not fun to get take a shot to the guts, but those are the big ones, right? And I mean, if you're going to get hit in and around the other areas, think about broken bones and so forth. Yeah. But those are the most important ones, this area, like right up here, where yeah, I yeah. love big brains. I lobe. Lives. I lobe. I lobe big brains. <laughs> <laughs> so it shows my nerd right but, here. But- with if you get hit in the abdomen and yes. you're bleeding internally, isn't that where the blood's supposed to be? What? The blood's supposed to be internal. That's oh good. Oh my god! <laughs> it's supposed to be in the blood vessels. If you bleed internally, you're still bleeding out of your heart. Okay, actually, you know what? You're right. That's actually not a stupid question. Okay, so <laughs> no, it wasn't being a stupid. It wasn't a no, question. No, no, it was no, no, no. This a is stupid a stupid statement. No, but this is free. <laughs> so when you know, blood is supposed to be internally, and I think Nick, you know what? No, this is a very. It's, I mean, it's a true thing. People maybe like they may be asking this question. Yeah. So blood is in a few places in the body, right? Yeah. But we want blood to be in our piping, which are our arteries and our veins and our capillaries, right? I have a good example. What you want the. Water in your house to be in the pipes. You don't want it on your carpet. (laughs) Yeah, and basically what Nick is doing is he's letting it fill up the basement right now. That's not good. Yeah. So when you have internal bleeding, you're filling up the basement. You're causing a lot of damage to the house, a.k.a. body. Especially if it's winter, like right now, and it flash freezes, Mm -hmm. and then rains again, and the flash freezes, and the rain is... Well, get over it. (laughs) Winter. It's fun. Canada. Yay. Love winter. Yes? That was all I had. That was all you had? Yeah, it was a boring gun. <laughs> no, it really is a boring gun. I wanted to put that one in there mostly because I like the... like People love talking about ogrens because the ogrens are so, so much fun. Explain to me why people love the Imperial Guard weapons. Because they are pretty lame. <laughs> people love the Imperial Guard weapons because it's sci-fi enough that there's a lot of interesting stuff in there, but there's also... It fits within that theme of 40K, which is... This was technology from when technology was incredible, but now everything has declined so much. You have a gun that can shoot micro suns at people, but will explode in your hand. Which is lame. Which is kind of lame. But people love the Imperial Guard as a general thing because it's just the everyman fighting the horrors of the galaxy with nothing but his flashlight and a t-shirt up our episode today where i review the medical implications of five imperial guard weapons if you have any questions for me leave them down below yeah like and subscribe and if you want to check out more check out our every faction video have a good one peace bye